J.T. Crowley is Talking Books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. They'll give you their take on the writing process and how to create the secret sauce of page-turning deliciousness. Let's get into that magical mixture of the art and science of creativity. Here's J.T. Crowley, author of The Smart Kids and your podcast host. Hello, everyone. I'm J.T. Crowley, and I'm super excited to talking to my new author today, Teresa Hill from Los Angeles in the United States of America. Um, having chatted to Teresa over the last week or so, I think it's fair enough to say she's led an interesting, um, varied life from her early days in Oregon where she rode her horse, Tiffany, um, with her dog trotting beside, to her competitive figure skating career that took her all over the world and which was very exciting for her. Um, right through to her present day career or path, however you want to phrase it, everybody. Being a hairstylist to, on the Hollywood sets for TV and film. So you can see she has had a very, very varied life. So she <laughs> chats everybody to directors, producers and actors. She does their hair. And for the... Um, the rich and famous actors. Very interesting, isn't it? But along the way, she wrote short stories as well as becoming an accomplished painter. In 2005, she started to put together the idea of writing children's animated series of books that now come under the title of The Wildly Whimsical Tales of Gracie and Sniggles. So on the show, we're going to talk about two of the books in the series that come under this magical umbrella because these stories are absolutely fabulous, everybody. They really are. All about Gracie and Sniggles and their adventures. And the first book is The Mystery of the Blue Goo. And the second one is Boo Hoo. So let's chat to her about her books. And I simply say to Teresa... Please join me on the show to come and chat to us all about yourself and your book. Well, hello, and thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here, and um, it's such a pleasure meeting you and um, speaking with you previously a little. Um, yeah, I'm just really excited to be here, and I'm um, very, very excited about the um, reception that the books have received from um, several people and um, several well-known people. And hopefully my hope is, is that this uh, series of children's books will help to um, maybe touch a few children's lives and help them navigate uh, difficult situations if and or challenges that they might face in a lifetime, right? So that's my hope. Yeah. And in the process, enjoy, enjoy the uh, adventures. Why not? I'm, I'm intrigued, um, Teresa. In your editorial review, mm. uh, I noticed the remark, when I grow up, I hope I become the person my dog thinks I am. Mm. Who does your dog think you are? A very kind, <laughs> compassionate, understanding, generous, um, human, citizen of the world. You know, yes. I mean, yeah, that's, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I just saw that and I just thought, Do you know what, I'm going to uh, open the show with that line, you know, I thought, <laughs> I wonder who a dog really thinks she is. Because hmm. dogs have different minds, they you know, they they you know, they sense things far more than we do. Don't yes, they? I agree. I agree with you, and I think that as a child, most children, uh, most children, um, want to have a pet right and um and if they don't have a pet they usually have a doll or they have um an imaginary friend 
um, that they, you know, connect with. And I was lucky enough as a child to grow up in the Columbia Gorge, which is um, basically, I grew up in a town of 900 people. Hmm. Very small town. I was born in a large city, Portland, Oregon, and uh, in the United States. And I moved uh, to a very small town. And I was lucky enough to uh, be afforded that you know the the animals in which I grew up with. I had a I had a, a chipmunk. I had a, we had rabbits. I had horses. We had I had a chinchilla, <laughs> dogs, cats, horses, and I was very you very had lucky. you had quite a few, didn't you? Yes, yes, yes. So that's and why I, you know. Um, my my question, I suppose. Oh, one of the questions I want to ask you is, um, I'm intrigued, Trace, as to why you chose to write very young children's books as opposed to books uh, about, you know, your figure skating days or tales about the, the back set gossip on, you know, film and TV sets. Because Jackie Collins made a heck of a career out of Hollywood's wives and all the gossip and the scandal, didn't she? And I just thought, hmm, I wonder why Teresa has chosen children's books. Why? Um, because I've always been an advocate for children and animals. Um, actually, um, I feel like they don't really have voices as um, it's kind of an, an odd um, analogy, but I was on my way driving to a um, film festival and there was a there was a dog that had been hit by a car that was alongside of the road and it was a city and on, it was on a corner and right next to it not right next to the the body of the dead dog but there was a um a, a homeless person that was passed out from uh, drinking too much alcohol, I'm assuming. And the police were um, called to the scene. But before the police came, I saw some children walking up and my friend and I pulled my car over and I had a blanket in the back and I got out and I put a blanket over the dog's body. Um, and the police got to the scene just as I had completed doing that and I was getting in my car. And of course they wondered if I had hit the dog or whatever. And I said, I, I just, I did, I, 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 I did that, you know, the children and, and uh, they nodded their heads and thanked me. And I said, the difference is, is that, you know, they don't have choices. Children and animals don't really have choices. They don't have voices, right? So they, so as adults, we do, right? No matter what our upbringing is, no matter what we've been through in our life, because we've all had good and bad happen to us and experiences in which maybe un, you know, foreseen circumstances that affect our lives, but we all have choices as adults, right? And I think that children, um, I think if you have a book in which like I, you know, we all, we all have had, uh, uh, books in our past and as children growing up, characters in which we've connected with. And that's what I'm hoping my book does is connect with a child to help them, like I said, navigate earlier, like I said, the, the, the maybe difficult situations or challenges they may face um, in their futures, you know, um, helping them to understand um, how to accept uh, and the importance of friendship, uh, tolerance towards others, with others, with circumstances that they face. Um, yeah. So I, and you know, and on that note too, um, as an advocate for children and for animals, um, you know, uh, I do give to charities with my royalties uh, that I receive from my books. So I. Uh, 100% of my royalties from the Mystery of the Blue Goo go to uh, St. Jude's uh, Children's Hospital. Uh, I also um, have donated um, several books to their Ronald McDonald um, houses. Um, so uh, I just thought it was appropriate that the books were available to the children and the families because they have libraries in their houses where the families stay for free and uh, while well, the children are battling uh, cancer. Um, and I also like give to the uh, 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 a charity for uh, 
animals with uh, a portion of my royalties from uh, Boo uh, Hu. So um, I do what I can, you know, and um, like I said, I'm just an advocate for uh, children and, and animals. So whatever I can do to help. I wonder, that was all. Um, because I think like most people, we can all remember the books, the authors that we loved as kids. Um, yeah. I don't know if you ever heard of Enid Blyton. Mm. I loved Enid Blyton, the famous five, the seven series, absolutely loved them. Um, she was vilified by the, um, oh, the literary elite, but she sold hundreds of millions of books. She's still on the bookshelves. And where are her critics, I say, long mm. and dead. Mm. But I, I want to come to your book now, The Mystery of Blue Goo. And I want to ask you how you came, how you brought about these magical blend of characters for young kids to love and adore. For me, this... A uh, combination of characters, you know, um, Ziggy, Lucy, um, Bob, um, you know, and the, you know, Sniggles. And they just <laughs> absolutely work. Mm. How did you create them? You know, where did you conjure them up? and especially your main character? Well, um, I had, I, I, I actually write screenplays um, as well. I have a, a body of work that I've accumulated over the years. I have a lot of poems. I write poetry as well, short stories. Um, but I was writing a screenplay, oh my goodness, uh, two decades ago. And I had a Sharpay and his name was Bigsby. And I used to, his nickname was uh, Sniggles, Mr. Sniggles. And, um, and I got that from Snuggles. And I, uh -huh. um, I yes. And uh -huh. I had a, um, I had a Brussels Griffon, a dog named Gracie. And I thought, you know, the two of them together were so, were so um, curious and um, they were, they were cute together because one was really tiny and one was really big and very wrinkly. And um, I thought it would be so fun if they were to be made into some type of character at some point. And I, it was just an idea that I had. And um, so that basically stirred the, the process. And then of course, throughout the years, um, having had so many animals, I actually um, developed the characters um, Ziggy from a chickmunk that I had uh, as a pet. Uh, I adore up. Ziggy, everyone. Ziggy is fantastic. <laughs> he's, an, he's, he's, full of, he's full of anxiety. He's, he's a squirrel. <laughs> yes, he's a squirrel. And he's very nervous about everything. And he is just wants, you know, he doesn't know what's going to happen. And everything is just, you know. <laughs> oh, he's, uh, he's crazy. He's crazy, yeah. everyone. You know, quit your selling. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's, oh, the thing that I love about your writing is the, the rhyming that goes on in the mm. book. Mm. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's throughout the book and also in the other book, but I'm just talking about the mystery of blue goo at the moment. And, oh, the, the rhyming is amazing. Thank you. And, Thank you. you know, the technique, wh where did you, you know, create that technique? Was it just, you're just good at rhyming and poetry, things like that? <laughs> Gonna or has it just happened? I don't know if I should say this, but um, I, you know, a lot of times when I'm with my animals and or with or with children, I kind of I, I I talk in kind of a funny little voice. I think we all have funny voices that we use with uh, with babies and with animals. And when I speak to my animals, I kind of talk to them with this with this rhythm and rhyme. And I've had friends over the years say, "God, you've got to do something with that." And I come up with little nick 
names and and things as such and i i think that that's where it all kind of got started and um when i originally began writing um this idea down um i uh sniggles was the one that was going to talk in ry rhythm and rhyme and it ended up that the stories the first story ended up i, I really liked how it was kind of coming about um in uh in this lyrical uh, way so um and i think it also helps children to uh with a lot of the teachers that i've uh, talked with and it helps children to learn how to read as well and um to recognize and utilize uh which i fine. knew there was something behind it you see do you mind if i read a couple of pages of the book teresa oh, I love that. Everybody. I love that. i'm going to read from uh, page 14 everyone and um I'm quite good at doing voiceovers, so I hope this comes out really well. Once they arrived at the shack, Gracie knocked on the door. Rat-a-tat-tat. Hello, she called. She knocked again and again. Is anyone in? She muttered. There wasn't a response uttered. Sniggles shuddered. Gracie turned the doorknob to the shack, and that's when Bob crowed, attack, attack, out of nowhere. Acorns sprinkled, spattered, and scattered everyone. Go away! Quit your yelling. I don't want your selling. Sneaky the squirrel shouted as his fluffy tail switched and twitched. We're not selling, so quit your yelling, Bob called back. In a frantic antic, Ziki threw his last nut with a hiss. Lucy caught the nut with her mitt. That would have hit poor Bob on the knob. And Ziggy was now sonked. With everything he could muster, he kept on with his bluster of jibber and jabber. He scurried in a flurry, gathering the nuts he had scattered. He zigged and he zagged, picking them up one by one, hurrying to get the job done. Gracie watched with delight at this sight. After all, he did sprinkle and spatter the nuts he had scattered. Curious, she asked. So much chatter. What's the matter? He slowed his pace and he looked up at her face. He looked so shattered because no one had ever asked him what was the matter. Silly clown, turn that frown upside down. Don't worry as you scurry in a hurry, my furry little friend. No need to be sad, even though you were bad. Gracie smiled. I'll be your chum, don't be glum. Singles gave Sniggy a judge. With a grin, Lucy chimed in. They'll help gather all that matter that you've scattered. Then she sat back to clip in her claws. Bob rolled his eyes because he wasn't surprised. Lucy was a cat who could be a bit of a brat. Everyone except Lucy began picking up the nuts. So there you see everybody, there's the rhyming and there's the um, technique that uh, Teresa has used. And I hope I did some justice to your little um, <laughs> excerpt there. Oh, thank you, thank you. Now, yeah, I, want, they... Go ahead. I want to move on if that's okay with you to Boo Who. This is mm -hmm. the second book in the series. And it's here, you know, we've got the same characters, everybody. But Teresa has added um, a few more characters. We've got Boo Hoo, um, sorry, Boo Mug Montague, not Boo Hoo. Uh, we've got Sully the Snail, who delivers the mail. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we've got wonderful, cheerful characters again. Of course, this book is all about saving Halloween. You know, scaredy pants, path, creepy streets, fairy stories. Where did you get this idea from to put this magical, wonderful second book together? Um, Halloween. Yes. Um, well, it, Halloween is always um, a favorite of most children's, uh, you know, childhood. I mean, we, we, when we get to choose our costumes, um, you know, we wear our costumes if we can, 
right for weeks ahead of time um and then we like to wear them after and and uh so it was definitely a um a, 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 a time of the year in which I wanted to, um, that we celebrate, and it's the time of year that um, children have most fun. So it was kind of an, um, uh, an obvious choice um, to write about. And I wanted to write a story about uh, children facing their fears and how to do that. Um, and um, so that's where uh, Boo Montague came in. And uh, Annie McFanny, the witch who cancels Halloween. Annie McFanny, Annie was uh, a cocker spaniel, black cocker spaniel I had. Um, and she used to dress up, I used to dress her up like for Halloween and we would, when the kids would come around for trick or treat, she would always go out and greet the kids with her little witch costume on. So that's where Annie McFanny came in. Um, and your and wizard? The, Yes, and Mr. Mr. Uh, wizard uh, uh, Gracie was uh, dresses up like a wizard uh, for Halloween. There's a little secret there, you know. Mr. Finkelstein, her next door neighbor, is a retired wizard, but that has not been uh, uncovered and discovered yet. That's coming. Um, but uh, it's. I think that children may possibly be curious as to why Mr. Finkelstein has a magical map that helps Gracie and Sniggles and the gang, uh, helps them get to wherever they need to get to. Like they, in, in uh, uh, Mystery of the Blue Goo, they have to get to 555 Honeycomb Hive because they have, to, they have to get little Bumble, a little bee who has accidentally been turned blue and is not accepted by the queen in the hive because he doesn't he's not the same color as all of the other bees in her hive so he's not accepted so they figure out what the mystery of the blue goo is and then lo and behold when they get back to the hive when they do get her uh bumble back to 555 honeycomb hive and they go on their adventures and meet all kinds of interesting character don't tell anybody Yes, when they get back there, when they get back there, the <laughs> queen, there's, there's something in store and Gracie and Sniggles and Mr. Finkelstein are able to help save the day. And uh, in Blue, in, excuse me, uh, Boo Montague. Um, Can you read a couple of pages from Boo? Yes, 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 I will. Um, okay. You probably um, do a better job than I did of the pages in... Um, <laughs> mystery of the blue goo um okay uh let's see now what's happened in uh the first couple of chapters in uh boohoo um they receive a note in the yeah. snail mail only the snail delivers the mail and they've received they've they've all got their costumes picked out they're excited to celebrate halloween and they received notice from annie mcfanny that halloween has been canceled so they need to go to see mr finkelstein um because he'll know what to do so they go over to mr finkelstein's house and um they approach mr finkelstein um gracie pulled the rope that opened the gate and they all walked in, except Boo, who cautiously drifted behind. Mr. Finkelstein was unaware that they were there. He was busy making something utterly, unbelievably fantastically fantastical. Clickety clack, whippity womp, tickety tap, ting. Mr. Finkelstein, we're in a bit of a pickle, Gracie called out. I wish I had a nickel every time somebody was in a pickle. What can I do to help you? Mr. Finkelstein inquired. Like the whiz that Gracie is, she quizzed. Do you know an Annie McFanny? With a smile, he replied, I haven't heard that name since the last harvest moon 13 years ago. Gracie turned to Sniggles and mumbled, 13 years ago. That's a bit of a quinky dink, don't you think? Sniggles nodded. Mr. Finkelstein spotted Boo. Boo Montague, is that you? Why, I know your great grandfather, Stu. Boo grinned. You do? Yes, I do. It's nice to meet you, Boo. Bob interrupted with a frown, cleared his throat, <clears throat> and cawed. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Finkelstein. We need to stay focused here, Annie McFanny. Gracie jumped in. This came by sna snail mail today, 
She handed Mr. Finkelstein the announcement. He opened it up to read. Gracie asked, how can Annie McFanny cancel Halloween, Mr. Finkelstein? Because she's a witch with a wart who wears a pointed hat and has a black cat. She has a spider who loves apple cider and she zooms on a broom in front of the moon. For many moons, she was seen every Halloween until 13 years ago at the last Halloween hullabaloo. That's the last time anyone saw Annie McFanny. This wasn't good because everyone understood that when she flew in front of, flew on her broom in front of the moon, trick or treat would safely resume. Wow. Why did she stop flying her broom in front of the, the moon, Ziggy squeaked? Because Halloween could be seen in every magazine and had become a routine and making nothing more than a, became nothing more than a money-making machine. There were no cheerful spirits to be had anymore, only mad, scary ghosts that were very, very bad. This made Annie McFanny sad. Kids thought it was dumb to dress up like a stick of gum or read a, or, or a red drum or a banana split. So they quit. And that was it. Annie McFanny threw a fit on that moonlit lit night without a fight. She packed up and was out of sight. We have to find her and change her mind. She can't cancel Halloween, Mr. Finkelstein, Gracie said. Where should we look, Sniggles sniffled. She lives in an old house way up there somewhere where Creepy Street meets the dead end. Mr. Finkelstein pointed towards the hills. How are we going to find Creepy Street? Gracie quizzed. Wow. Aren't the stories great, everybody? They are absolutely wonderful. Um, you're, the illustrations are fabulous, aren't they? Um, oh. Both the books, they're breathtaking as far as I'm concerned. Do you and Kareem spend hours talking about the illustrations, you know, putting them together? Yes, we do. Um, we collaborate on everything. Um, and of course, you know, I had created the characters well before I had uh, found her and um, she just took them to the next level. Um, I adore her. Her work is beyond magical um, and she just brings it all to life. So it's just such a pleasure to work with her. You know, when we were writing Mystery of the Blue Goo, her country was being invaded by Turkey. There was, you know, a scuffle over there. and. Um, it ironically enough um you know here she was uh illustrating a book for me that dealt with acceptance tolerance and friendship and being kind and um her her country was at battle and her husband and her um brother uh had to go uh fight in the war and um it was really um it was really for me you know, ironic that she was um, illustrating such a magical children's book um, while um, this was going on in her country. You know, um, when the, having said that, um, on a happier note, everybody's safe. By the way, her 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 husband and and brother uh, are uh, safely home, and um, things have settled down a bit. Um, but when she was writing Boo Hoo, uh, or excuse me, illustrating Boo Hoo, when we were writing it, she became pregnant. <laughs> wow. So, you know, it's beautiful how um, life, uh, you know, can throw challenges your way and also beautiful things. So she's expecting uh, her first uh, baby girl. And uh, we're looking forward to our third book. We've got, I've got seven books um, that I um, have uh, outlined and they all deal with different challenges that uh, children face. And, um, and parents also sometimes have difficulty um, finding a way or a story or um, some way to maybe guide a child through uh, difficult uh, situations and or challenges uh, in, in life. So very true, very true. Um, your books are aimed at what children, you know, what four to eight? Uh, yeah, age range? yeah, four, four to eight is a, is a good age range. Um, and and I think depending too, on their um, reading ability, of course, reading ability, oh. exactly. And we all have, we all, um, are, are we all like, um, you know, in my third book, you know, uh, um, 
uh, it's going to be magic. Uh, it's magical mo, and um, you know we all we all move at different paces. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Where can people get your books? You can uh, you can get them on Amazon. You can get them in actually. You can order them through any bookstore. Uh, you can. Uh, um, Amazon's probably the fastest way. A lot of people use Amazon for everything nowadays, don't they? Yes, they do. Uh, but you can order them through any bookstore. That's wonderful. Teresa, it's been a great privilege talking to you today about your books and a little bit about yourself. Um, these are fat, you know, fantastic books, great books for kids. Um, even for, you know, depending on your child's reading ability. Um, but a, a lot of parents, you know, we love reading to the kids. So these are great bedtime stories to read to your kids at night time or for your own child just to um, read for themselves. Have a look at the pictures, and which are beautiful. Absolutely yeah, vibrant they, colors. They're, they're, wonderful. You can, also, you can also get it on Kindle or Apple as well, which is kind of fun because you can, it's, um, there is, uh, Joanne does a beautiful job with narrating and bringing the characters to life. Wonderful. So that just leads me to say, everybody, thank you very much again to um, Teresa for her endearing, winning storylines, beautifully written, fabulously drawn books. And all I say to you guys is get out there and go and buy some copies. Thank you so, so much. Absolutely. So as I say, every week, I'm JT Crowley. Thanks for listening, viewing, wherever you are in the world. Until next time, stay safe. Thank you.